My selection of the best of the rest this episode, with a few more high-profile titles and a couple of infamous ones. Uncharted Waters New Horizons provides a lot more guidance for the player than the first game did. This is to say a pure sandbox is back. That's how Sid Meier's Pirates works, and that game is amazing. It's more that Uncharted Waters New Horizons give you an option of a variety of characters, each with their own objectives that reflect a different playstyle and then drops you with that sand in the sandbox and lets you go. Now you can choose characters with objectives that reflect how you like to play these types of games, and will kind of reward you for doing that, whether that's engaging in piracy, or rather privateering, or exploration, or trade. While the game isn't particularly graphically intensive, I'd put this at about Final Fantasy II levels of graphical depth. Mechanically, it works. Well, Final Fantasy II slash Final Fantasy IV. Anyway, mechanically it works, and it works really well. I even like how the game uses a combination rock, pa paper, scissors with a um, numerical value card battle mechanic for sword duels. It is, in short, an improvement on the first game in every respect. It's also kind of hard to come by, which means you're going to be paying out the nose for a copy of the game. So keep that under advisement if you're thinking about picking it up. Al Unser Jr.'s Road to the Top is, on the other hand, a somewhat solid hybrid and sim um, arcade and sim-style racing game. It has issues, though. It, it controls fine, but for some reason, for the kart tracks, the game designers decided to put in track hazards, um, and not in the form of, like, the power-ups you get in kart-style racing games. We're talking just patches of oil and water on the track just lying there that will cause you to spin out, and your car doesn't have a reverse gear, not even an automatic that you can use to back up and get straightened out again. You have to pull a full Yui, which costs you a lot of time. I mean, and it's frustrating is also, this is the kind of thing that most people normally check on before the race, as far as walking the track, and they have people do that and that sort of thing, especially for commercial courses that are used by the public because they don't want customers getting hurt. Um, the inclusion of the track hazards thus become a necessary inclusion, and it's aggravated somewhat by the fact that while AI, uh, CPU racers, will occasionally hit the patches, they don't do, though, do so with necessarily the degree of regularity that, say, the player will when they're trying, because a lot of these hazards are pot put on really good racing, on, on not quite the ideal racing line, but, like, just off of the ideal racing line. So, it, it, I can't quite recommend it. Now, Shaq Fu is, on the one hand, a fighting game with the level of fluid animation to expect from the developer of Flashback in Another World. Very crisp, very fluid animation, which is rotoscoped from um, live action actors. Um, that is as good looking as what we're getting from Japanese fighting games around the same time, more or less. On the other hand, the game has one very significant problem that hamstrings the entire game, particularly the, the single-player story mode. And that is that the character animations for our protagonist, basketball player Shaquille O'Neal, fail to account for the fact that Shaquille O'Neal is a very tall man. Like, the problem is, like, Shaq punches and kicks above opponents' heads all the time. And, I mean, Sha Shaq is seven foot one. To put this in comparison, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who had a fight scene with Bruce Lee in Game of Death, is one inch taller than Shaq. So, consequently, um, like, I, I understand how the idea of having a game based around a basketball player doing martial arts, who is very tall, but, like, Kareem's fight scenes, he's not, like, constantly kicking above Bruce Lee's head so he can nail him. Um, like, the whole point of those fight scenes is Kareem's height, like, the fight scene, and the way it's choreographed is Kareem's height gives him reach that, um, 
Bruce Lee doesn't have, and he has to compensate to deal with it. And you can absolutely make a game about this, where you, okay, you have opponents who are really good in fighters, who you have to then adjust your style around. But when... The problem is, is when your character himself doesn't have the wherewithal to take advantage of their height and through, and as demonstrated through their attack animations, it makes the game immensely frustrating. I appreciate what this game is trying to do. I just wish it did it better. Super Bonk feels weird to play, because on the one hand it's a very Japanese style of platformer, complete with the very tight and deliberate controls, but on the other hand it has the sort of unstructured feel that European pl platformers, especially Amiga platformers, have. After playing, for se playing several levels or screens for 20 minutes or more, uh, no point did I get any sense of how close or how far I was to a boss fight. I don't see any problems with this sort of unstructured game experience, but I also want some sort of degree of getting across how much progress I'm doing in the work through filling in an objective like collecting golden bananas or stars or having progressed along some sort of map screen, whether literally as with um, Super Metroid or Castlevania Symphony of the Night or with something more abstract like Super Mario Bros. 3 and Super Mario World. Thus, while the game, again, controls incredibly well, the lack of feedback on whether I'm actually getting anywhere makes it frustrating to play. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein has a lot of elements um, of some of the worst licensed video games. The controls are a mess, with an attack reach that's too short, combined with endlessly respawning enemies who have attack ranges that are too long. There is also a lack of direction to the game's levels that makes it just unclear where you need to go, and how to get there, that feels reminiscent of early Famicom games, but without the excuse of relative inexperience with the platform that came with that particular flavor of Kusuge, and the fact that this is a Western-developed game. Thus, it's a title that is just a bloody mess to play, and really frustrating and unfun. Skip it. Watching Nickelodeon Guts was very much a formative experience of my childhood, and it has led to my fandom and appreciation of shows like Ninja Warrior, which makes the video game version of Nickelodeon Guts so disappointing. In theory, you could do a game about this based on making it like a more involved track and field. A collection of mini-games based around each of the events of the show, which you'd play against the AI, but is also probably best played competitively. It's almost that, but not quite. It is best played competitively. Indeed, the single player mode is just called practice mode, and but and this is a collection of mini games. However, the, the game's fault comes in with the structure of them, because the mini games are fairly monotonous and the controls, well, real are are okay, but are finicky in all the wrong places. Specifically, it's due to how the game structures it is there are effectively two types of events platform events for obstacle courses and shooting events for the like the basket for the like the salt event and the free throw event or slam dunk I believe it is um with all this with the added problem that the shooting events the controls are simple but bland you hold on the down button to charge up your jump. You jump, you press the B button to shoot, and then you hold, press the, don't, hold down the uh, down button again as you're on the way back down from your shot in order to be able to make the jump back up the platform and speed up the, the uh, time before your next attempt. The obstacle course levels are done as platforming sequences, and the controls are way, way too finicky, particularly when it comes to the having to grab hold of things that you need to climb up, like ropes and poles and that sort of thing. Because you have to be per placed just so, with the additional aggravated problem of your jump is like this big arcing somersault thing, um, with no option for like a smaller jump, 
to go to hop between two close together uh, platforms or two close together vertical poles or that sort of thing. Give this game a miss. Michael Jordan Chaos in the Windy City is better than it has any right being. It doesn't mean it's an especially great game, it's, it's good and it's shockingly well done. The controls are solid and aiming the basketball is somewhat intuitive, though the game could do with some more of a like a six or four away shot. The game isn't flawless by any means, the checkpointing is rough, and in one instance after dying I lost a key that I needed to progress in the game, basically forcing a hard restart. Still, considering the oddity of the concept, I was shocked to have had as much fun as I did. Metal Morph was a promising, but ultimately unpleasant, mess of a game. It's a game from Origin. Um, from the research I did it determined it's a Super Nintendo original, but it feels like a PC port. And the concept is neat. Um, you are, your character is the titular Metal Morph, a metal blob that can switch between humanoid and blob forms, with a mix of run and gun action platformer levels that use both forms for traversal, interspersed with behind the back shoot 'em up levels but where things fall apart is the controls and the difficulty. The controls feel like they're calibrated, particularly for the shooting sequences, feel like they're calibrated or designed for a joystick with the level of granularity that an analog joystick provides. Um, it's, I much found myself moving a lot more around the edges of the screen instead of having the ability to kind of maneuver through the middle of the screen to evade obstacles. Further, the Run and gun sequences give you only like six lives to start, though they call them continues. Um, and while there are um, one ups dispersed in the level, which you will need, um, but only one actual continue, so to speak, in terms of one actual go through. Once you run out of lives, it's game over, that's it, no opportunity to pick up where you left off. So, which, again, makes the game incredibly frustrating to play, because I have the metaphorical arcade machine, as the analogy goes. I should be able to set it to free play. Um, and there's no real way to be clear, like, okay, if I turn down difficulty or anything like that, will they get additional lives? It's a frustrating, obnoxious mess, and I'm disappointed that this came out of Origin. You know, the company that gave you Ultima, Wing Commander, that sort of thing. Stone Protectors is a TV show and toy line that is basically troll dolls meets Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So the video game based on that show is, well, fits with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles title with a beat-em-up. The problem is the proportions of the characters don't make for a satisfying beat-em-up beat -up, as everyone's reach is just a little bit too short. Now, it's not that you can't have a fun brawler with stylistically smaller characters. Mighty Final Fight and River City Ransom pulled that off. However, both of those games didn't try to have the characters punch as if they'd realistically punch. If you look at the animations for the protagonists in those games, they overreach with their attacks. Um, no actual fighter would stick their arm out that far when throwing a punch. It would leave them open. Whereas here, they tried to go more realistic for the attack animations, and it ends up with you basically not actually having the range that you need with these characters to deal with the enemies who are on screen. I'm not sure if this is an issue brought on by licensor demands, or using reference footage from the cartoon, or just not trying to, if you'll forgive the expression, stretch themselves in that way, but it leads to the combat being clunky and, again, not fun, which is important for a beat-em-up. You need to have your combat work. GP1 Part 2 is an engaging motorcycle racing game with a degree of some simulator elements, which controls incredibly well and with very simple, not overcomplicated controls. It has a solid sense of speed and it does a lot with a little in terms of controls, just using basically like two buttons, maybe four if you are using uh, if you are using a manual transmission with accelerator, brake, and then upshift and downshift on the shoulder buttons. Perfect. 
Though, if I have any complaint though, it's with the difficulty. I tended to find myself at the back of the pack very early on, even with some generally solid racing on my part, and it always felt like without doing every lap perfectly, I wouldn't be able to recover and be close to actually being in the front of the pack, which was frustrating. And made it feel like I wasn't actually progressing in the game itself. Newman has IndyCar Racing with Nigel Mansell has some really solid controls, like the exact same control scheme. Um, I almost consider this style like sort of like Gears of War, not Gears of War, but um, Call of Duty shooting, except with uh, racing games, which is fine. I dig it. But it has the opposite problem. GP1 Part 2 had no rubber banding. Newman Haas IndyCar Racing has rubber banding to keep you in the pack, but it also has collision detection. So you are, and it had your car as a health meter, which means you are constantly banging into other cars, um, which can lead to you getting bumped back to the back of the track. And then when you try to move your way back forward, you end up getting smacked around some more and knocked back to the cat pack. And in turn, with the footage that I used while taking footage for the show, led to me being forced out of the race due to an injury because the thing is, indie cars are big and they take up a lot of space on the track, so they are very hard to maneuver around, particularly when you have like 12 or more cars jockeying for position. So again, it's the alternate side of the coin. You get to interact with the other racers, but not in the way that you actually want to. You, there's, you're still not feeling like there's any actual degree of progress. Unshattered Waters New Horizons is definitely my pick of this lot of games. It's also probably one of the one of the more expensive ones. It tends to run for the Super Nintendo version in like the forty to fifty dollar dollar range for loose and an inbox copy getting even higher. There's also a Genesis version out there as well. It's a little less as of this recording, but it's still surprisingly steep. It's definitely on the higher end of uh, Genesis titles. Um, on the budget side, actually, I would have Michael Jordan, Chaos, and the Windy City as a budget runner-up, which is a sentence that I've never imagined saying when I started doing this show, having heard of the game. But, again, in, for my its reputation, I thought it was going to be a terrible title. I am quite shocked that it's the other way. And, I mean, pleasant surprises like this are the reason why I do this show is discover this title that was garbage and just going from the name and discovering, oh, no, this is actually a legitimately exciting and engaging title. Next time, with episode 99, we will finish the best of the rest before we return to Nintendo Power Magazine proper with episode 100. I'll see you then. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, Tossing me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.